Hello folks and welcome back to the next part of our Be Quiet build. Now, you may recall in the introduction piece that I said we were going to be making a new case window, specifically one to replace the standard temper glass that comes with it, because obviously we can't really do anything to this. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making an apple style cheese grater window that goes on the side, which will hopefully provide a little bit more airflow for this case and also just look a little bit special. Now, in terms of cheese grater, what do I actually mean? How am I going to be doing this? Well, let's go take a look at that now. So if you're not familiar with the cheese grater design, basically it's the vent that Apple uses on the front of their new Mac Pros. So it's essentially a row of circles. Now these are milled into the front of the aluminium plate in the Mac Pro. And then on the back, they've got another row of circles like so. Now the effect here is that you have a sort of a concave surface throughout all of these. And they've done that by using a ball end mill to make it nice and round along the edges. And so if we take a look using this red pen, it basically means that all this area here is all empty space, and that's airflow. But how are we going to do this for this particular design here? Because I don't really want to do circles, because that doesn't really make sense. There are no circles on the case, and it works for Apple, but for Be Quiet, not so much. Well, we can in fact use a different shape and then just alter things a little bit. So I'm going to be going with triangles and this is how I'm going to do it. Now, since I don't want to use circles, I'm going to be using the triangles that are found on the vents inside the Be Quiet Pure Base 500. And these look like so. And then I'm going to machine another row of triangles that are exactly the same on the other side, but flipped around. So like so. Now, whilst this isn't exactly the same as the uh, Apple one, because obviously I've not offset the rows and two axes, only in one, it will have a fairly similar effect and it should look pretty interesting. And also it should provide a little bit extra airflow just because these areas are all going to be cut out. So that's quite a lot of material that's gonna be removed there and it should boost a little bit of airflow but more crucially, it should look particularly nice. Hopefully it'll be able to take on the light and anything like that will just glint off the surface and it should look rather special. So let's jump into Fusion 360 where I've already modeled this up and I can talk through how I've done it and what I'm going to be doing on the milling side of things. Right, so we're in Fusion 360 and this is the window mod design that I've chosen for this build. Now, as you can see, we've got these triangles running down the right hand side and then a large cutout area, which is going to be going on top of the CPU cooler and the GPU. It will provide a little bit of extra airflow, but honestly, the real reason is I just want them to be very, very visible. Because when you put a reflective surface over things, it does actually make things quite a bit harder to see and details can get lost. So I thought it'd be nice just to bring it to the forefront, sort of like a hot rod type thing, just make it as visible as possible. Now the whole window uses the same uh, method of attachment to the case as the original window, so it has these little thumb screws in the corners over here, and that should keep things nice and simple. It is going to be thicker, so this is 8mm thick rather than the 4 on the default window, so that will mean that we probably won't be able to use the default thumb screws for this, so I'll have to source some ones which are a bit longer, which maybe have like a bigger screw thread going through the middle, and then perhaps even re tap the case just to make it fit, but either way, that'll be quite a simple fix. But you might be thinking, Hold on a minute, Alex, that doesn't really look like a cheese grater. Well, that's because I haven't actually extruded all the way through from one side to the other. So if we take it over over here, we've got the triangles on this side, and then we've got them on this side too. So if we just switch from this default steel material to something like glass, it should give quite a good idea as to what this is gonna look like. So as you can see, we've got these overlapping triangles, these ones face down, and the ones on the other side face up. And that means we've got these lovely vent areas between, which should provide a lot of space for the air to pass through, as well as just looking a little bit interesting. I've also gone and applied a chamfer around the outside of these front facing ones, just so that it catches the light a little bit more, because I want when the light around it moves for it to glisten, glint, and just be you know, visually interesting. And I do love a little bit of chamfer work around the acrylic. It just really makes it pop and it brings the shapes out a lot. 
Now one of the reasons why I chose 8mm acrylic rather than 6 is because I was a little bit worried it might not be strong enough during the actual machining process. Because obviously when you're machining you're putting quite a bit of a stress on the material itself and I didn't want to find out that maybe part of the way through because this is quite a big job. If I got like halfway through and it would snap something because that's where it's going to be weakest I just, oh, I don't know, it seemed a bit risky to me so I thought let's just keep it simple, go with 8mm and that should be fine. Now. I did mention that I haven't gone all the way through and that's for manufacturing reasons and I'll explain that in a second in the manufacturing tab. But how did I actually make this thing? Well it was quite simple really. You just use a sketch to draw the first row of these triangles and then I used the pattern tool just to bring it all the way down. So I've done it on this side and then I just did exactly the same on the other side, extruded them down and then I've left 0.5 millimeters of stock between the two surfaces. So let's just hop into the manufacturing tab and I can explain exactly why I've done that and why these things on the outside here exist as well. Now this is where the fun properly starts because making the thing is the exciting part. And first thing you'll notice is look at all these warding triangles. Now don't worry about those, those are just there because the stock is a little bit too small for the model. And the reason for that being is I'm only going to be machining up the outsides of these bores here so all of this excess material it doesn't need to exist. And it just so happens that that goes outside of the bounds of the material that I've ordered. It's not a big deal, it's not going to affect the machining in any way. So how have I actually done this? So what we're going to do is we're going to start by machining these bores. Now what do these do? Well, these are actually going to be the locating pins that I'm going to be using later on for the double-sided op. And I'll explain exactly how that works when we get to op 2. Let's just go through the first one. So we're going to be doing these bores and then we're going to be going straight into the pocket cuts. Now, this first one's a bit experimental. I just wanted to uh, play it nice and safe so I've used lots of multiple tool paths for this one rather than using a pattern. So we've got one, two, three, four, and six. Now the reason why I've done that is if I have to stop the operation or, or change anything around midway through it's a lot easier if you only have to deal with smaller tool paths like this because you can then just choose an operation or a point in your g-code to resume your operation from and if you've got like a massive stack of millions of lines then it's really difficult whereas if you've got individual operations like this in the g-code when it's exported it's all commented you see so you can find them quite easily and resume from there. But basically what I'm doing is a 2D pocket. I'm going to be running the machine at following settings. So I'm using 22k RPM, 3mm end mill. I'm going to be using a cutting feed rate of 1500mm per minute. And the same things for the lead in, lead out and a slightly slower ramp just to kind of take a little bit of edge off that. And the crucial thing here is that I'm doing a maximum roughing step down of only two millimeters. Again, just to keep it nice and uh, nice and simple on the machine. I didn't want to push too hard with a quite small end mill because the harder you push it, obviously the more at risk of actually breaking the material you have, the end mill will be fine. But then I'm also going to be using an interesting stock to leave. So what I've chosen is zero millimeters for radial because the edge is gonna have a great finish anyway. We're gonna be going over it twice. That's gonna be fine. But the axial stock to leave is minus 0.3. That means it's going to be cutting below the bottom of this surface. And that is how we're going to be cutting through from one triangle to the other. Because if you have this fully modelled in where you've got all of the overlaps, you're actually going to find this is going to be quite a difficult shape to tool path because you'll be able to go around the outside but the tool will try to go maybe too far below and it's actually much easier if we just leave that out of the modelling stage and just do it all on the manufacturing side of things. So that's what I've done and I'll be easily able to adjust it on the machine to make it a little bit deeper or more shallow if need be. Really I'd only need to make it deeper just in case I've not quite got it right for the stock that I've got to hand. The actual operation is quite simple though. We're just going to be running a normal 2D pocket and then I'm going to finish it with a classic uh, finishing operation which is a horizontal which just goes over and does it in a slightly different fashion so it overlaps a little bit differently and doesn't have abrupt corners to it. This should leave an absolutely polished cut and that's very important because we're not going to be able to polish this thing. If your distro plates come out a little bit cloudy, you can just polish them up. Yeah, well, good luck trying to polish up all of these millions of triangles. I mean, yeah, if you've got all the time in the world, perhaps you could do it, but 
that's not a better I, I a good way to do it. You're much better off just doing it on the machine properly the first time, so that's what I'm going to be aiming to do. Now Op 2 is really where the magic happens for this particular job, because this is how we're going to be getting our proper cheese grater pattern. But that does involve machining from the other side, and we need to make sure it's nice and accurate. So how am I going to be managing that? Well, the way I do it is by working these into the design, which are these boreholes. Now, they line up with my fixture plate, like so, which means I can use some 8mm dowel pins to locate this work on the fixture plate itself. To get the coordinates, what I've done is added the uh, fixture in the setup menu, and then I'm going to be using this here as the origin point. And this is the origin that I've got listed on my machine for the fixture plate itself, which means that it will from now on basically be using exactly the same coordinate system and be very easy to use. In terms of the actual machining, again, it's quite simple and very similar to the first operation. I'm starting off with the bores here, which are going to be used for the mounting screws. And then I can move to a pocket. Now this time, what I've done is a full on pattern. So I've done it all in one go. And basically this is because I'm assuming I'll have worked out all the kinks in the original operation and this should go much smoother. Exactly the same thing for the horizontal pattern, which cleans it all up. Then followed by a series of 2D contours, which basically cut it out. Now what I've done here as well is I've added in a chamfer which is going to be on the outside here and then also going to be adding one for the bores and again a patterned one which goes around the outside here and that should leave a lovely finished look and really catch the light thanks to the polished cut of that particular end mill. After that it's just a matter of steadily cutting it out so that it doesn't fully take it off the plate. I want to make sure that the backing material isn't cut through and that will help hold it in place as we're doing the cutting. With that all said and done, I think it's about time we do a simulation of this work just to double check everything, export it, and then get a proper machining montage going. Well, needless to say, I am very pleased with how this particular window has come out. I think the triangle effect is exactly what I was looking for, and it's really quite interesting how the light plays with it. And also, hopefully it should give a little bit of airflow, but look, I've got this massive cutout. It shouldn't really matter. 
I think having the extra little details like the chamfers on the top really adds to the look and just you know, a little bit more finesse. It's also nice to try something a little bit different to the norm because quite a few people have gone and done the actual round apple style one. So trying something different with the triangles or maybe in the future with hexagons could be quite interesting. So I'm you know, glad I gave this a go. It's definitely a good learning experience. And unfortunately, if you want to see what it looks like on the case itself, you're gonna have to wait until the next part because we're still working on the case itself. So for now, this is what we've got, but it does mean that you have the chance now to subscribe to the channel if you're not already following us, because how else are you gonna find out when the next part goes out? Don't forget, you can also find us over on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, builds.gg and Discord. I'll catch you next time, folks.